Uh, welcome everyone. Thank you for joining us for today's expert webinar, AI and ML Deconstructing the Jargons. I'm Payal from Spring People, India's largest enterprise training provider, and I will be your moderator for today's session. So in today's webinar with a decade of rich experience across the analytics technology stack, we have our expert Cheyenne, who has a unique blend of extensive production experience on cutting edge AI, ML, and data science technologies. Today, Shine will help simplify the jargons of AI, ML, data science, talk about the latest technologies, and supplement the learning with real-life industry use cases. If you have any questions during the session, please type it in the chat box, and they will be addressed by Cheyenne after the presentation is over. So without further ado, let's start today's session. Over to you, Cheyenne. Okay, thank you so much for passing it on, and I wish all of you a, a, a very good afternoon. I hope everybody is doing good. Hope everybody is doing safe and uh, uh, very excited to be part of this webinar and to address all of you. So I'll be quickly sharing my screen and I hope everybody is able to see my screen and you're all able to hear me absolutely loud and clear. So once again, uh, uh, very good afternoon. I can still see some people are joining in uh, at this stage as we speak. So just to lay down the agenda of what we are covering over the next <clears throat> one hour or so, we'll be looking at primarily a very basic introduction to AI. I think it's important to clarify that because artificial intelligence is, is such a huge uh, technology stack that there's so many things involved. So just wanted to clarify upfront, we are gonna talk about AI, we're gonna talk about, we're gonna deconstruct the jargons uh, around AI. So one of the things that we <coughs> see in artificial intelligence is a lot of jargons get, tend to get used. Somebody talks about AI, somebody talks about machine learning, somebody talks about uh, deep learning, and then there is this thing called data science. So uh, that's basically what we're going to try to do for the first 15, 20 minutes, deconstruct some of the jargons, talk about lots of use cases, uh, very practical use cases, especially in the current uh, context of coronavirus. We'll see some very interesting use cases how AI is being used to tackle coronavirus. And from there, we, we also intend to show you some uh, practical hands-on demonstrations on how uh, machine learning is being used in these contexts. All right, so let's begin. And first of all, what is this thing called data science? Like when, when we come across this term called data science, what is what what do you mean by data science? Before we get into AI and other things, what, what is what is this thing called data science? So data science, in a way, is not a new thing at all, right? Although the term is very popular, although you know it, it's something that we tend to use in a in a big way, but data science as we know it, this is not a new thing at all. We've been using data science, <clears throat> we've been doing data science for a long, long time. So next time when you hear the term data science, analytics, data science, analytics, statistics, data science, analytics, statistics, <clears throat> or for that matter, or for that matter, data mining, all these four things mean one of the same thing. All these four things, in a, in a way, effectively mean one of the same thing. That means the process of taking in raw dirty data, the process of taking in raw dirty data, raw dirty data, and converting that to information or insights. Right? Now, what is the meaning of this raw dirty data? What do you mean by what do you mean by this thing called raw dirty data? Remember, all organizations will typically have data in a in, in some kind of a format, right? So uh, in at its source system, the data will be stored in some format. See, for example, if you're a bank, let's say if you're an ICICI bank and you know, you're, you're taking care of customer transactions, somebody sends money from person A to person B, a transaction happens, that data will ultimately get stored somewhere in some source system, right? That is effectively what we call raw data. It could be a, it could be a data warehouse, it could be a, a Hadoop cluster, that's another set of technology areas that are involved in that, right? So, uh, or it could be something as simple as, let's say you're a sales manager and you're tracking the sales that you're doing over your respective uh, regions <clears throat> and you're tracking your sales figures for the last 10 years, right? So that again constitutes raw dirty data. So as and when you make uh, sales on a daily basis, you're entering the numbers on your, on your spreadsheet and that again constitutes raw dirty data. <clears throat> but then that data is absolutely useless. You cannot use it, right? So the process of extracting information, for example, as a sales manager, I can construct a, I can construct a simple bar chart and I can say that, hey, over the last 10 years, the overall sales I made is this much. Or let's say I made a 5% year-on-year increase in sales over the last 10 years. 
okay i can draw a simple line chart out of the data and i can present the insights to you rather than presenting a simple spreadsheet so this process is what we basically call uh, data science analytics statistics data mining effectively we are doing the same thing so so uh, I think I did not share my introduction with all of you, but I was able to try to relate this to all of you. So uh, this is Shine here once again. So uh, <clears throat> just wanted to talk a little bit about this. And, and the reason I'm talking is because I was also very heavily involved in data mining. <clears throat> so if I if I go back to my experience 10 years back, and I've been in this industry for around 10 years now. So if I go back to what I was doing 10 years back, I was basic, data science was not as popular a term that time, right? That time we used to call it data mining. Data mining was a very popular term and I, I used to use R quite a lot. Okay, uh, the R programming language was very popular around that time. Python gradually <laughs> gradually picked up over the years. But around that time, if I have to relate back to around 2011-12, I would say the R technology stack was very popular and data mining as a term was very popular. Right, data science eventually evolved. Data science, there was a, uh, there was a very famous Harvard Business Review article, if you all recall that data science is the sexiest job of the 21st century, right? Yes, a lot of it has to do with a bit of marketing twist, but eventually if I if I look back at the way we have been doing things, analytics as a whole, has, is, it a, is, is it a new thing? It's not. So we've been doing this for a long, long time already, okay? All right, so this is, a, <clears throat> a, you know, just a small introduction to what data science actually is. And next time anybody tells you that, hey, you know, this is data science and what is it? Effectively, it's, it, it, it's a simple process of converting the raw data into information, right? Yes, there are a lot of different tools involved. There are a lot of different skill sets involved. That becomes a very different ball game altogether. But at its core, that's what data science actually means. In fact, in fact, and what, what I'll basically do right now for all of you is, I'll, I'll quickly go back and present this very interesting uh, study, very interesting quadrant that uh, Gartner's also released. So I'm going to quickly present that to all of you. <coughs> so this is basically the Gartner uh, analytics ascendancy model. So what you're seeing on the screen right now. So this is the Gartner's analytics ascendancy model. Just goes to show that this uh, this is something we've been doing for uh, I would say decades in a way, right? So analytics by itself can be broken down into four pieces. We have descriptive analytics, diagnostic analytics predictive analytics and prescriptive analytics. The best way, uh, I, I see the best way to understand what these, uh, you know, uh, these jargons actually mean in a way is to take a simple example, right? What is the example we'll take? Let's say we'll take the example of a sales manager. Okay, so you're the sales manager right now. So this is you and you're looking at a huge spreadsheet of data which spans last 10 years worth of sales data. You're a sales manager and you're going to a, uh, let's say a, 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 some kind of a presentation where you have to present how your products have sold over the past 10 years, right? So you are looking at the last 10 years worth of data and you are trying to explain what happened. So this is what we call descriptive analytics, right? Is it data science? Yes, it is data science. Is it statistics? Yes, there are statistical techniques you use. So effectively they mean the same thing. That's what I'm trying to once again, try to deconstruct these jargons for you, right? So you can create a simple line chart wherein you say that, hey, over the last 10 years, my sales has, has, has basically increased like this. That becomes a descriptive analytics problem, right? So looking at data and answering questions like what happened is descriptive analytics, right? You might actually spot a very interesting pattern. You saw your sales are going up, going up, and then eventually one, one year, the sales actually dropped. Very interesting, and then again, it peaked. This is what you see happened. This is what happened, descriptive. Diagnostic takes it to the next level. Diagnostic tries to predict what, why it happened. It's a causal analysis. So in diagnostic analysis, you, you, you see that a big drop happened, a very sharp drop happened around that year. In diagnostic analytics, you're basically trying to figure out root cause why it happened, right? Predictive analytics is the next level wherein you're trying to predict what will happen. So this is sales data over the last 10 years. And as a sales manager, obviously you're, you're trying to make predictions of your forecast for the next year. Every organization, every public listed company, I think Infosys uh, is, is renowned for their guidance. Okay, so uh, so every every organization will produce guidance for the next financial year, right? How how much uh, uh, you know uh, their net revenues are going to be. So this is what we call guidance, right? And and stock analysts and all those uh, uh, share markets will constantly look at the guidance of these large enterprises to get an idea of what the business forecast is and what the business scenario is. So this is predictive analytics. If you, if you ever see an organization coming up with guidance, so don't think that this is some 
some rocket science thing. We have been doing this for ages. So although data science is something that you most of you are uh, curious about, you're learning about it right now. Everywhere, every you know, everywhere, uh, you know, uh, some of the other courses in data science are coming up. But we have been doing this for a long time. Predictive analytics, as it is, has been around for a long time. Okay, uh, and finally, <coughs> prescriptive analytics. So this is the sales manager, and he has a mandate to increase his revenues. Let's say his sales, let's say 20% next year. So to increase the uh, the the revenues of the sales 20% next year, uh, <coughs> I have to do X, Y, Z. That means I have to spend this much amount of money in marketing. I have to spend this much amount of money in campaign advertising and all that stuff, right? So to achieve, so how do I make it happen? So prescriptive is, is almost like a doctor writes a prescription. So, you know, the patient wants to get cured, right? So the doctor says, okay, to get cured, you do X, Y, Z stuff. That means to achieve this much amount of sales, you can do, you can spend this much amount percentage in, uh, you know, uh, TV advertising, this much amount percentage of money in uh, in digital uh, marketing, okay, digital channels, this much amount of uh, percentage of money in traditional channels like newspapers and stuff like that, okay, and, and that basically like uh, you can define a prescriptive problem that way, okay. So again, uh, this is more like analytics as we call it, and effectively what we have done until now is we've understood what is data science, right? So next time anybody talks about data science, uh, you know what it is, you know what it what it means. Now, let's come back and start talking about the beautiful world, start getting into the beautiful world of artificial intelligence, right? So what is AI? Let's start getting into AI. So I'm, I'm drawing a, so in fact, uh, you know, uh, what you're seeing on the screen, what I'm using is something on Microsoft Whiteboard. And I think uh, no better ex example of a session that we are having right now than talk about Microsoft Whiteboard itself. So you can see that if I draw a shape, it automatically constructs cycle, uh, a circle, right? Very interesting. So if I draw a rectangle, uh, whiteboard automatically constructs a rectangle for me. You try to draw a parallelogram and it automatically tries to guess that, hey, I think you might be trying to draw a parallelogram. It's very interesting, very cool, oval. It'll try to draw an oval. Oh, not quite, okay? So this is very interesting. Please make a note of this, mental note of as we get to the technical details in a while. Uh, it, it tries to guess that what I'm trying to draw, but in this case, it wasn't able to guess. It, it, it does its best to guess, but sometimes it may not. You can see it is not able to form the oval correctly right now but other times it might just do well, okay? Here it is unable to guess correctly, as you can see. Other times, okay, wonderful. It actually draws an ellipse for me, okay? So just keep a mental note of this as we get to the, uh, the details of our stuff right now, okay? Now, first of all, what is artificial intelligence? Now, when we, when we hear this term AI, what do we mean by AI? I'm sure all of you have heard of this. It's not a new term. It's not some rocket science I'm discussing right now. Everybody in this audience, you've come across a term called AI before, not like the first time you're hearing it. But one thing that I, I see most people struggling with is somehow people don't understand the difference between AI, ML, and all that, right? So, so <coughs> people typically think AI, ML are the same thing, and that's one one thing that we're going to try to uh, demystify. What is artificial intelligence? What's machine learning? What's deep learning right now? So, uh, the kind of AI that we have, uh, generally speaking, the most common form of AI that we have is what we generally call rule-based AI, right? In fact, artificial intelligence as a term dates back to 1950s. 1950s was a great year, right? 1950s was the year when a lot of things were happening. Boolean algebra concepts were uh, just getting discovered around that time. Uh, the concept of gates was coming up. Uh, some of you might have heard of Alan Turing, okay, Turing machine. Okay, one of the uh, major uh, experiments were conducted in with the Turing machine that time, okay? <clears throat> and there was a Dartmouth conference that happened. There was a Dartmouth conference that happened where the term AI was basically first coined. Okay, there was a huge interest in the, uh, you know, in uh, among mankind to basically see how can we make machines do things. So it's around that time that the term AI was coined. So AI is not a new thing again, right? So although we are discussing artificial intelligence in the session, it is not a new thing, right? So the discovery happened all the way back in 1950s, and we have had machines ever since. Okay, the kind of AI that is all around us is typically what we call rule-based AI. Now, this is one aspect that not many people can, you know are, are aware of <clears throat> so for example if you look at a uh, if you look at your laptop right now if i say is your laptop ai or if you look at your mobile phone right now the smartphone that you're using for calling along so is, is it ai it's actually artificial intelligence it is ai right what kind of ai is it it is ai that is based on rules that is what we call rule based ai ai that is based on rules okay what is it what does it mean so what it means is, it's almost like if you talk about your laptop right now, let's say if you're using a Windows operating system or a, uh, 
uh, Linux or a Mac, oper Mac OS, <clears throat> the operating system is a set of instructions, right? So the Microsoft developers or the Apple developers would have specifically hard-coded instructions telling the machine what to do and how to do it, right? So they would have written code behind the scenes which tells the machine what to do and how to do it. And that is basically what we call rule-based AI. Very important, okay? It's all around us today. Uh, you just have to see anything that remotely resembles a machine. <clears throat> is it AI? Yes, absolutely it is AI, but it is what we call rule-based AI or the traditional expert systems as you might want to call it, okay? So once again, uh, you know, as I said, like, let's say if your smartphone battery goes below 15%, uh, right? Imagine a scenario where you're using your smartphone right now and the battery goes below 15%. So what do you do? What are the, what, what happens? Okay, couple of things start happening. A, your, the, the screen of your smartphone will dim, the brightness will reduce, okay? And B, what will happen is, it will, it will go to battery saver mode, right? So these instructions have been automatically codified Android developers would have written specific code instructions wherein they have specified that if the battery level goes below a certain percentage, then these, these, these actions will be taken. And if you try to open your camera and if you try to take a picture, the flash will not work. That is again hard coded. That means if your battery goes below this much percentage, these operations will not happen and these operations will continue to function. That is what has been hard coded. Right? And this is what we call rule-based AI. A small kid can look at that machine or, or, or that smartphone for that matter and say that, hey, <clears throat> something wonderful is happening. It's almost like I'm interacting with a robot right now. And that is true. That is not, 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 not untrue. That's very true. You're, you are interacting with a robot in a way. Only difference is that robot has been hard-coded. Somebody has hard-coded the instructions. So the way to look at rule-based AI is, <clears throat> it's, it's almost like you're talking to the machine and the machine will do exactly what you say. Okay, so it's, it's, the machine will do exactly what you say and it is near flawless. Okay, in fact, anybody who has been involved in traditional software development in this audience, I'm very sure more, many of you, <clears throat> many of you in this audience are involved in traditional software development, right, wherein you're working on web development, ASP.NET, Java, C Sharp, right? Anything that remotely resembles coding, if you're working on any of those kind of platforms right now, you're actually, building rule-based AI systems, okay? So think of developing a website. When you develop a website, what do you do? You're writing specific instructions as to how you want the website to look like. Isn't that intelligence? So next time a kid will go and say, hey, I click on this button and something some, somehow magically, uh, I, I get to see my records. Isn't it magical? So it's like saying you go to facebook.com and you click on photos and automatically Facebook understands that you want to see photos and it sends photos to you. And that's magical, isn't it? That's AI, right? That's intelligence, right? But then that intelligence is hard-coded because you have specifically written instructions saying that, hey, if the user clicks on this particular button, it's basically a hyperlink. So if you click on this hyperlink, then the results, the, the photos will be fetched from the Facebook server and that's what you're able to see. So it's, this is what we call rule-based AI in a way, right? Think of, think of all these massive, gigantic, uh, you know, <clears throat> automatic factories, right? Where they man assemble cars, they assemble planes, they assemble <coughs> all sorts of other items, okay? So these are machines, right? <clears throat> you take a small kid there and the kid will say, okay, I see robots all around me. It, it, now, why am I taking this example of kids all this way? Because remember, machine learning, machines learn the same way kids learn. So if you can relate these uh, this to basic analogies of human beings, you can understand these concepts better, okay? So if you take a small kid to the factory floor, the kid will say, I see machines all around me. I see, I see AI or robots all around me. That is very true. But you and I, now we understand that it's robots, yes, but it's a very naive version of a robot. It's a very basic version of a robot. <clears throat> in other words, it's a rule-based AI robot because the instructions have been hard-coded. Nine to five, the robot has been asked to do a specific operation uh, throughout the day. <clears throat> you go to any major hospital and you will see machines there. So what kind of AI is that? It's rule-based AI. Again, specific instructions have been hard-coded. So it's, it's almost like you press a button and something happens, okay? So that's basically what rule-based AI is. So what is the problem with rule-based AI? Now, as you can imagine, rule-based AI has been around for a long time and it, it continues to be around. Uh, in many, every aspect of life that we interact with, we see some form of rule-based AI or the other. So what is the challenge with rule-based AI? So why, why this thing about machine learning and why do we need to worry about something else? Why, why can't we write code and why can't we build machines by writing code? If we have been able to successfully build powerful machines like laptops, smartphones, 
you know all these gigantic machines that we see around us uh, which obviously like tons and tons of code have to be written for building those machines so why can't we basically what is the challenge of rule based ai in a way right so anybody who is remotely confused about rule based ai even now think of it like a simple if else statement right so it's almost like you have a robot you buy a you buy a simple robot that is uh, <clears throat> you install that robot in your door the the, the, the front door and any, any any next time anybody tries to enter from the door the robot says hi that means what is happening behind the scenes what is the code you have written you have written a simple if else statement right you're saying okay if i see a sense a vibration i will say hi if not nothing simple so that's a simple instruction that you've hard coded very easy to build a rule based ai system but the problem is the obvious challenge why we felt the need to migrate away from these systems is <clears throat> that typically often times there might be scenarios where the rules are very hard or in other words the rules are impossible we don't even know the rules so normal real life scenarios you know most of the time we know exactly what the rules are other times we might not even know what the rules are okay so let me give you a simple example of that kind of a scenario let me give you a simple example of what that kind of a scenario might be okay so let's say let's say uh, we are talking about <coughs> let's say <coughs> i'm sorry we're talking about elephants right so yes i'm going to open up an elephant screen in front of you right now let's say i ask you to write code to detect elephants okay so let's bring up a a, a beautiful elephant here so this is a good one so let me just open it up for you now let's say the the task that you have in front of you right now is to write a simple piece of code using which the machine can detect it's an elephant right elephant detection system so what is what is rule based ai it is nothing but a set of if then else statements right so you say if this then this if if i see this then this if this then this okay <laughs> if battery less than 15% turn on battery saver shut off flash okay if if the laptop battery goes below 10% uh, go to sleep mode okay save the applications and go to sleep mode so this is rule based ai often times you would have seen the fan speed Uh, the, the fan revs at a very high speed in your laptop right what kind of ai is that again rule based ai so specific instructions have been written wherein you are saying okay you know if 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 these 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 things happen then then the fan speed will typically increase okay so these are all rule based ai systems now if i have to implement a similar kind of thing here <clears throat> and i'm sure all of you are already getting a a hold of what i'm getting at right now so you will say that hey what are the characteristics that define elephants so if i see two tusk that means the that that white ivory that is jutting out if i see two tusk if i see one tail if i see one big trunk if i see one big trunk one tail right if i see four legs if i see a big body if i see a big body for that matter if i see a dark color that's what we expect right so you expect elephants to be dark that's a, that's a normal convention but remember elephants can be white also right so i'm i'm going to come to that in a second or for that matter you can also look at two big ears and two tiny little eyes compared to the size of the body <clears throat> these are the defining characteristics of an elephant so what you are seeing are the defining characteristics of an elephant so you can absolutely write a piece of code uh, what is code it's a simple set of if then else statements you can absolutely write a piece of code wherein you can say that if i see two tusk one tail one trunk four legs big body then it's an elephant else it's not right so this is uh, supposedly we can program it right so and in case people are wondering sign you know how do you program how do you write a code for this you know it can be done right for a long time uh, this kind of image recognition work image classification work has been done using basic rule based ai systems right anybody who is remotely familiar with python in this audience there have been libraries like open cv which have been used for this purpose so we can do it it's not like we cannot do it it can be done now what is the obvious challenge with this approach so what is the obvious challenge with the approach <clears throat> the obvious challenge with the approach is that elephants can come in all sorts sorts of shapes and sizes right so right now we are seeing this one kind of elephant but what if i go to a different kind of elephant so let me do one thing let me take you to a slightly different kind of elephant right what if i go to this guy here now as human beings i have absolutely no doubt beyond doubt i know this is an elephant but now the machine is confused because what are the rules you have written 
you are saying okay i want the elephant to have uh, two tusks one tail one trunk four legs but hey where is trunk tusk here right now i don't see tusk right now so now the 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 code that you've written is not flawless the code will not pass these checks elephants can come in so many shapes and sizes that beyond the point these rules will fail you have written rules right the rules have to work but these rules will not work for all kinds of elephants there are possibly hundreds and thousands of different types of elephants all around the world today right so obviously the rules that you have written will not hold good for all kinds of elephants and this problem becomes exponentially worse once you start looking at an elephant herd let me open up an elephant herd for you right now i think that way you can appreciate the problem much better so if you look at the elephant herd right now <clears throat> look at this one i think you're getting the idea of what i'm you know, what i'm getting towards right now so if you look at this one i think i'm beyond doubt i can say that these are elephants although i'm seeing a very faint background uh, the resolution might not be great but you get an idea beyond doubt i can say these are elephants but you can see the elephant is half submerged in water i can't see the legs so where is that rule what is the sense of writing that rule now that i see four four legs that rule will not work so these are scenarios where although the problem statement is very simple but the rules are very hard the rules are very complex and often times we don't even know the rules you can basically have a picture of an elephant <coughs> where you see nothing you don't see tusk tail trunk legs body nothing and remember you can't say big body because for a computer you cannot say big you have to specifically mention the dimensions and there can be infinite number of possibilities because then in terms of pixels the range can be very high and also you can't specify dark color color can be an rgb scale in red green blue scale there can be infinite number of color combinations right so you can't just say dark color so the so the reason behind highlighting this problem to all of you is to clarify that <clears throat> this is a hard problem and the rules are difficult and this is exactly where rule based ai fails and this is exactly where we look at a different kind of ai called machine learning based ai right <clears throat> so so in machine learning based ai what do we do it's almost like we are talking to the machine and now we are saying i don't know the rules the rules are very complex the rules are very complex now i don't know the rules so what you do is you don't code the rules because obviously you don't know the rules how can you code it so you can't code the rules so instead what you do is you give the machine lots of data and the machine figures out the rules for you and that's basically what machine learning based ai is i will talk more about this in a second uh, some more examples we'll see but remember one key difference is that in rule based ai you hard code the rules whereas in machine learning based ai you yourself don't know the rules the rules are so complex the rules are so different that you don't you yourself don't know the rules so naturally you can't code it and that way <clears throat> you need a very different kind of agent to learn those rules and which is what we call machine learning based ai so remember machine learning and ai are not like two different things they are not the same thing so in a way machine learning is a way of implementing ai often times you know all these courses that are doing the round ai ml somebody teaches something okay but the point is ai ml we need to understand what the difference is what how are the different it's not like they are the same thing so ai has been there for a long time the way of implementing ai has changed so historically we've been writing rules or we've been hard coding rules to implement ai to make machines intelligent and now the way we make machines intelligent has changed so machine learning has been used to make machines intelligent and how was it happening we'll see that in a second just to help you appreciate the problem here i will take you back to another very interesting domain right and here i will play a very uh, interesting <coughs> video for you so if, if the subtitles are a little unclear so please uh, excuse me on that but uh, i think hopefully you can get the basic idea so this was a very famous address that that sundar pichai developed uh, that delivered in <coughs> in you know in you know in 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 a google keynote address very interesting very 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 famous as well and what i want to do is i want to play this video for you for all of you for the next uh, uh, you know 2 3 minutes okay so that all of you can appreciate like once again the difficulties of natural language processing right so until now we talked about something called computer vision so this is another jargon i'm using right now okay so uh, the the process of the process of identifying that what you're seeing is an elephant that is basically a computer vision problem it's an image classification problem yes but it is a sub field of what we basically call computer vision so effectively a machine is trying to look at a picture and it's trying to identify what that picture is what is vision what the hell is vision what do you mean by vision what is the meaning of vision vision basically stands for 
so what when do i say somebody has vision right so the ability to see and process things is what we call vision right so what is vision the ability to see and process things is what we call vision so when computers are able to see and process things we call it computer vision so this is a, an entirely different subspace of machine learning it's a it's a it's a part of machine learning and this is basically what we call computer vision right so see if you think of a simple uh, eye so what is the eye the human eye <coughs> see the eye is like a camera okay see a camera does not have vision so by itself the eye does not have vision the eye can only capture images so if you take a simple camera and click a picture that is not vision you have simply taken a picture now you feed it to a processing engine and the engine processes what is there in the picture that is what you call vision and i think that the difference is very important to dissect so similarly for the human eye think of a person in a coma state a vegetative state <clears throat> right so that person is able to see and hear everything around themselves right so they can see the world around themselves they they able to take pictures of the world but the problem is they are unable to process it maybe some part of the brain is not working the signals from the eyes are not able to reach the brain so there's no vision although you're able to see you can't you can't there's no you can't vision there's no vision so that difference is important to understand and that is basically uh, what computer vision is all about so the ability to see and process things around you so one technology area is what we call computer vision the other technology area is what we call natural language processing so as we discussed in computer vision like typically problems around images writing rules are very hard it's very hard to write rules almost impossible i would say in certain areas it's almost impossible now here we are talking about elephants elephants still you have distinguishable features you still have you know eyes ear legs you can still write code around it but what if i ask you about volcanoes right <coughs> what if i ask you about mountains in fact let me take you to my google photos account let me take you to my google photos account for a second and let me search for <coughs> let me search for mountains here for a second mountains can come in so many different shapes and sizes right look at this this is also a mountain this is absolutely there's no snow this is also a mountain there's some bridges and all around it this is also a mountain you can now you can all of a sudden see snow and you can so how do i possibly write code for mountains and this is also like a mountain this is like greenery this is green mountain okay there are so many infinite number of mount, uh, different possibilities for mountains so just to show you the, the challenge of rule based ai systems rule based ai systems can come in all short sorts of shapes and size and uh, <clears throat> but 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 the point is you can't write code you can't specifically write code to uh, kind of you know uh, differentiate between mountains and not mountains very hard very hard to write code on the same lines think of your uh, think of your agents like <clears throat> amazon alexa and you know uh, apple siri and google assistant okay think of these technology stacks uh, think of these technologies they are also writing code is very hard okay so these are ai agents definitely so next time you say okay google uh, there's a there's a system that's able to understand what you're saying so when i say this even my google fired up actually okay so it's able to sense that yes you know science actually asked me to activate science said okay google and he wants me to create a meeting he wants me to set a reminder and all that stuff but do you think that's rule based ai do you think it's possible to write rules that okay next time science says this 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 do this okay if sian uses the, the the words this 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 do this impossible so in in computer vision there is still some possibility i can still possibly write code and i can still figure out but in natural language processing that's one more term i'm using right now what is the jargon i'm using right now natural language processing nlp right so the jargon i'm using is basically <coughs> natural language processing so just to kind of clarify just to kind of clarify the jargon i'm using right now is called nlp so where's that so it's natural language processing so natural language processing it's impossible to write rules in that context okay natural language processing so here writing the rules are absolutely impossible so there's no rules you can't you can't possibly write rules in nlp nlp writing the rules are impossible because there are so many infinite number of ways i can say okay google every time you say okay google you're in a different pitch a different bass a different frequency okay that the tone of your voice changes right so when you say create a meeting you can you can put it in different ways right you can say create meeting create a meeting for tomorrow okay uh, a meeting has to be created so there are different ways you can say it 
okay so once again goes to show how difficult it is to codify instructions for this you can't hard code rules for these kind of context okay and i can take you back to sundar pichai's address so this is a very interesting address he uh, delivered maybe i can play this for a uh, quick uh, two minutes for all of you okay just to help you appreciate how difficult natural language processing can actually get <clears throat> okay and all of this is basically leading us to machine learning and why and where machine learning evolves from because uh, this is one a very very key pain point i see in people generally as you're making and as you're learning machine learning everybody wants to learn machine learning but nobody knows the inspiration why ml is required okay? all the courses talk about algorithms and this that so eventually end up learning everything but some of people fail to realize why it is important right the differentiation the nuances rule based ai why the rules cannot be created so somehow i feel that part is missing which is why i think this deconstruction is very very important for people. okay so a quick two minutes on this guys and then we'll move on to in case the audio is a bit muffled uh, hope you can make it out uh, just idea is just to kind of give you a gist of it but in case the audio is a bit muffled try to relate to the subtitles get the big picture i'm, I'm sure most of you would have seen this video but uh, uh, but at the same time i know many of you have not seen the video uh, just so that everybody is on the same page okay just a quick two minutes on this video for all of you okay system is to help you get things done. It turns out a big part of getting things done is making a phone call. You may want to get an oil change schedule, maybe call a plumber in the middle of the week, or even schedule a haircut appointment. You know, we're working hard to help users through those moments. We want to connect users to businesses in a good way. Businesses actually rely a lot on this, but even in the US, 60% of small businesses don't have an online booking system set up. We think AI can help with this problem. So let's go back to this example. Let's say you want to ask Google to make you a hacker appointment on Tuesday between 10 and noon. What happens is the Google Assistant makes the call seamlessly in the background for you. So what you're going to hear is the Google Assistant actually calling a real plan to schedule the appointment for you. Let's listen. Okay. 
Oh, I got you. Thanks. Again, that was a real call. In many of these examples, that the calls quite don't go as expected, but the assistant understands the context, the nuance, it knew to ask for wait times in this case, and handle the interaction gracefully. Okay. Okay. So, uh, <clears throat> so uh, wonderful. I think I just wanted to show you, show all of you the, uh, just, a, just an example of the possibilities here. But uh, as you can imagine, this uh, towards the end, and uh, Sundar actually mentions that the assistant doesn't quite get it at times and, and a lot of these examples that the call doesn't quite was expected so this again goes to show that if first of all I think all of you will agree with me that it's impossible that it's, it's virtually impossible to uh, <coughs> in a way in a way write rules for this you cannot possibly write rules saying that okay uh, if the if the person is saying this 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 I will respond like this this is impossible to write rules but uh, once again goes to show that rule based AI fails in these kind of contexts right so what you need here what you need here so and if at all you you're wondering if at all you guys are wondering okay <clears throat> what could possibly be an example of a uh, of a rule based system I could possibly you know point you to an example in case some of you are wondering but if you talk about cutting edge you know assistants like Google and Apple CD these are all using machine learning, but maybe I can take you back to a, a slightly more traditional example, not quite traditional, but I'll take you to ICC Bank website right now. And here you have something called Ask iPal, right? This is again a pretty new feature. So uh, you know, banks generally, finance, financial uh, sector generally is a bit uh, <clears throat> slow to take off in these things. But just wanted to uh, give you one example. Let's say here I ask uh, iPal about mutual funds, Okay, mutual funds, and it, it 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 basically gives me some answers. So this is a beautiful example of a rule-based AI system. <clears throat> so it looks at the keywords and it sees that what kind of questions I'm asking, what kind of uh, things I'm pinging. So if I'm, if I'm if I'm asking something about mutual funds, then it basically gives me a, a description here. So okay, so but very so if I ask about uh, <clears throat> interest rates, if I ask about interest rates, it, it is basically having keywords. You can see as I'm typing. It is also uh, a list of these questions. These are these are pre-formatted, pre-framed questions. That means these are already uh, saved in ICC Bank's repository. So if anybody asks a question like this, give this response. If I ask about interest rates, see the, all these links are basically given to me. Okay. But what if I ask a slightly more complex question? Okay. I can always give a thumbs down. And what is this? This is basically giving feedback to the technical team and saying that hey like you better work on this okay anyways i mean i'm just giving an example what if i ask a slightly different question okay what is the best uh mutual fund i should invest in okay let's say this is the question i'm asking right now so it says okay uh <clears throat> you know it, it, what is mutual it didn't quite get it it didn't quite get it as you can see my question I, I wanted it to be a conversational you know uh, query I wanted it to give me a response if you ask the same question in Google please compare Google's chatbot and ICIC chatbot you can see the difference okay so here it's a it's a very rule based engine wherein it's it's basically responding based on uh, pre-saved queries so obviously there's certain queries that may not even work right for example uh, what is the best guild fund what is the best guild fund? If you ask, what is the best guild fund? Very interesting. So, what is guild fund? Guild funds are, uh, a, a, you know, a hot favorite nowadays. Equity markets are all over the place. Anybody who is into investing will understand. So, guild funds are into government securities, DSEX, okay, in a way. And <clears throat> so, if you, if I ask, like Google will not give you this. So, people, a normal assistant will try to give you an answer based on whatever query. But in this case, in ICIC Bank's case, they don't want to give a recommendation. So it says, please recommend the best guild fund for me. Please recommend the best mutual fund for me. But in ICIC Bank's repository of questions, that, that keyword doesn't come up. Okay, so this is again a, an example of a rule-based engine you can think of, okay, where there is not much of machine learning incorporated right now. And we'll see why this is the case in, the, in a while, okay? <coughs> so what is machine learning? We've been talking about machine learning for, for some time now. So what, what is this thing called machine learning? What do we even mean by machine learning? So in, in, in simple terms, in simple terms, Machine learning is this, okay? So leaving aside all the complexity, let's say I give you a question, one, two, three, four, six, seven, eight, nine, and I ask you what is the corresponding value for 10, okay? I'm very sure <clears throat> everybody in this audience will answer it is 11. So what is the corresponding value for 10? It is 11. 
right so how did you solve this question remember there were two things right there was an input and there was an output these are the two things given to you okay there was an input there was an output okay <clears throat> remember in 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 machine learning based ai the rules are not known you don't know the rules so you don't hard code the rules rather you give the machine lots of input output combinations same thing i've done i've given the machine lots of input output combinations that means i've given the data to the machine data has been provided input output combinations the machine uses some algorithm the machine uses some algorithm to create the rules this is also called a model and we also call it a function what is that function that function is basically y equal to x plus one okay and that's basically what we are trying to do as part of machine learning <coughs> right we are using different different machine learning algorithms we are using different different machine learning algorithms which is learning from the input output data combinations so you give the input output combination tell the machine okay when this is the input this is the output input output input output and you use an algorithm which tries to learn that pattern and eventually it tries to form a model what is that model that model takes the form of an equation which is what you are seeing right now the model typically forms uh, takes the form of an equation right now and that is basically what machine learning does for us so y equal to x plus one and now with that with that model that you have learned you can make make predictions so next time the value of x is 10 what is the value of uh, y it is 11. this is how simple machine learning is uh, so starting from the simplest of problems to the most complex of problems this is basically what we are trying to do show the machine lots of input output combinations show the machine lots of examples let the machine learn from those examples create a mental model out of it and then given a new kind of example what the value will be now you can relate this thing back to the back to all, all the use cases we have discussed until now let's go back to the elephant example <clears throat> right we discussed we cannot write rules for elephant right so how is google doing it so next time i go to google and i type in next time i go to google let's say and i type in uh, elephants right so how, how is google doing it how is google actually uh, you know looking for elephants here so how is it doing it so we have basically trained Google's model with lots of with lots of historical data. That means lots of these input output combinations have been given to Google. Google's system has been trained with lots of historical input output combinations of what elephants actually are. Lot of Google has seen lots of elephants. It is almost like how see machines learn the same way kids learn, right? So machines learn the same way kids learn. Machines learn the same way humans learn. So how do human beings, how do kids learn about elephants? The kid has to see lots of elephants in the in, in, in the past, right? So that is the same way machines also learn. Input output combination. It's almost like a kid is going to a nursery, right? <clears throat> the kid is going to a nursery and the teacher is teaching, okay, you see elephants here. The picture on the screen right now are elephants. So the kid is processing. Okay, the input is basically all the pixels in the picture and the output is the fact that it's an elephant, right? Example number two. The input is basically all the pixels you have in the picture and the output is the teacher is teaching it's an elephant. The input is once again all the pixels you have in the in, in, in the picture and the output is basically the fact that it's an elephant right now, which is what you're seeing on the screen right now. Okay, this is how you're basically learning from input output combinations. This is how you're basically building a model. Next time I show you any new picture, Google Photos automatically knows to classify that under elephants, which is basically why the next time I, I take a picture, I can take a picture, uh, you know, maybe randomly I can take a picture. Next time I take any picture, Google Photos will know to classify that under elephants category. Okay, so that's basically what the crux of machine learning uh, effectively is, right? So pl please remember a couple of things, couple of things you should all keep in mind. One is data, one is algorithm and model. So you, train the you, you give a lot of input output combinations a lot of data that you have a lot of input output combinations you take let the algorithm train on the data and basically at the end of it all you build a model so this is effectively the crux of what you're trying to do as part of machine learning again uh, as, as i interact with a lot of people i see people use these jargons very loosely uh, people somehow think machine learning algorithm and models are the same thing it's not a lot of even books and articles also talk about it it's not they're two different things okay algorithm is different model is different Model is basically the final end function that you're basically getting. Algorithm is how you're arriving at it. So the fact that you, <clears throat> that most of you were able to arrive at this y equal to x plus one was through an algorithm. In our case, we used a very powerful human brain algorithm, which, you know, it could, it could be anything, right? 
but in in the case of machine learning there are several algorithms that we'll be using like linear regression logistic regression support vector machines and so on so forth, right so which is a, a very technical topic all over but this is the crux of what we have in machine learning generally okay if, if you think of a very simple example <clears throat> let's say you think of a small kid right think of a small kid and the kid is going to school and the kid wants to learn about fruits okay different types of fruits very first first day in school if, if, if the kids very first day in school the teacher is teaching about the teacher is teaching about you know uh, uh, fruits so this is a bunch of kids that are sitting in, in the class okay and, and the teacher is teaching about fruits so how, how how will the kids learn right the kids are learning about the shape let's say the kids are looking at the shape size and color of the fruit and finally the type of the fruit okay what is the fruit actually called okay so these are your inputs and this is the output okay so what are the what are the inputs the inputs are the shape is round the shape is round the size is small the color is red and that makes it an apple all right the shape is round the size is small the color is orange and that makes it an orange so this is basically how the kids are learning so next time when when the teacher shows a fruit on the on the board the kid the kid is basically absorbing all his features the kid is able to visually see all the features i mean i'm just giving examples the brain doesn't process it like that the brain processes information like pixels the way we do it the way machines do it it's looking at the parts of the image okay uh, there have been studies that have been conducted on that as well <clears throat> so but basically this is the input output combination that you have right now okay so uh, input output combinations okay use an algorithm use an algorithm use some algorithm and build a model out of it okay this is where you're using some algorithm and you're building a model or some function out of it which links the input to the output next time next time the kid comes back at home next time the kid kid comes back home let's say the kid comes back home and the mother shows a new kind of fruit so this is what the kid has learned in school so what what is this model called how do you intuitively think of the model okay this is important because there's too much of technical nonsense that gets spread in machine learning right but the intuition is very important what is what is this model model is basically the knowledge okay so you have attended one full day in school <clears throat> what is the knowledge that you've got that's basically the model okay that is the model now you come back home and your mother wants to wants to test you what you learned right so the mother shows you a new kind of fruit what is the fruit the mother shows you let's say the mother shows you something that is a, a cylinder something that is little large something that is yellow what is it should be a banana but the kid is confused okay okay what are you teaching me i don't know i have not seen it Today was my very first day in school. I learned only apples and oranges. Teacher only taught me round shape. You don't even know what a cylinder shape is. And you're confused. You have not even seen that. Mother is showing a banana to the kid. Mother is expecting the kid to answer. Kid is seeing, okay, cylinder, large, yellow. Uh, have I seen it? Have I seen it? I don't know what it's called. Kid is confused. The kid will try to make a nearest guess, but that is incorrect. This is exactly what I want to clarify, that machine learning can be prone to errors also. Just the kid can make mistakes. Human beings can make mistakes. That means you have not seen this data before. You have not learned this thing before. If you have not learned something before, how can you answer it? Same thing in machine learning. If you have not exposed the machine to any uh, uh, some particular object before, the machine cannot give the right prediction. Okay, so machine learning is fundamentally prone to errors. Very important. The same reason why Sundar Pichai mentioned in the address that sometimes the assistant gets things wrong. It's not able to seamlessly interact. Right? We saw the second conversation in that video where the assistant was getting it wrong. So whatever training data was provided, it was not able to sufficiently train well on it. Okay, so these are mistakes that machines make, right? If you go back to my, uh, if you quickly go back to my, the image use cases that I talked about, I'll take you, take you to my Google Photos account. See, I have, I'm searching for elephants right now. Google has correctly classified elephants here. Google has correctly classified elephants here. Google has correctly classified elephants here. But Google has incorrectly classified elephants here. This is not an elephant. This is somewhat resembles an, uh, some, some a bird. It's a big bird, right? Ostrich, I think something of that sort. So, it, so uh, somehow Google is mistaking this cylinder, this this kind of a this kind of a uh, this is to be the elephant's trunk. It is making a mistake. Okay. And furthermore, you go back to this this picture. It's a rhinoceros. It's nothing remotely connected to an elephant, but Google is somehow thinking it's an elephant. So this this is not an elephant, okay? But Google somehow thinks it's an elephant. It's not. It's somehow it's uh, something is getting wrong. Okay. Maybe it's looking at this picture. My only hunch is looking at the picture at the background, but even that's a rhino. But maybe it's faded. Maybe you can see only part of the rhino right now. 
so google thinks as an elephant here so again this just to just goes to show that machines are also machine learning is fundamentally prone to errors right so this one is a little hard to believe uh, why google got it wrong but google actually got it wrong you can see this is not an elephant okay this is uh, i don't know what it is uh, this was in singapore zoo i visited singapore last year last to last year sorry and this was a night zoo very interesting it's a night safari and this is not an elephant but google is getting it wrong okay so just to kind of uh, clarify <coughs> the mistakes that are possible in machine learning right so the same reason why if you look at a a, a tesla car right there's so many new stories come around of self driving cars are crashing why do they crash because again machines are fundamentally prone to errors you can't possibly you can't possibly write code to drive cars impossible impossible imagine human beings are you know you you can't right machines learn the same way kids learn the same way human beings learn how do you and i relearn to drive cars we sit in the passenger seat and we observe somebody driving we look at the pattern right we also do it the same way we are looking at input output patterns right so we are saying okay the traffic conditions are like this this is the car near me this is the car behind me when the conditions are like this i can see you hit the brake that's how i'm learning this is basically how humans are also learning right the same way machines will also learn the initial self driving car project when it came out of google x right that that car had to be trained for hundreds of miles somebody had to manually sit inside the car and it had to hear that person had to drive the car for hundreds of miles just for the car to pick just for you to get the data <clears throat> the input output combinations okay given the road conditions are like this the car is going like this given the road conditions are like this the car is driving like this okay and i'm basically talking about a very simplistic example but you are capturing several metrics not only the speed but also the acceleration the gear change everything everything is basically taken into account there what speed you are driving is the most important factor basically okay so again it's prone to mistakes it's prone to errors okay so please get an understanding of this and uh, at this point in time i hope all of you are comfortable with the basic difference between ai and machine learning very very important okay often times these jargons are misused in a big way and they continue to be misused in a big way but i hope the the basic the broad understanding of <clears throat> what is machine learning and what is ai is okay with all of you okay the so what is machine learning once again what is machine learning based ai <clears throat> it is the kind of ai where the rules are not known the rules are very complex so you give the machine lots of input output combinations the machine figures out the rules for you what are the rules that that y equal to x plus 1 is basically the rules okay the rules are dynamic unlike in rule based ai the rules are static in in rule based ai the rules are hard coded they are static in machine learning based ai the rules are dynamic why do i say is dynamic because if your patterns change if your data patterns change tomorrow if elephants start looking like something else if elephants start looking very different the the logic will also change the rules will also change so that's why we say machine learning based ai is dynamic and they are error prone very important rule based ai is flawless this is a typical way you and i we write code normally right developers write code that way you can't go to your manager and say that hey this is a buggy code i want to deploy a buggy code you can't deploy a buggy software it has to go through a proper life cycle of testing qa so only then it, it will be deployed but machine learning by its very nature when you deploy those machine learning models it is prone to errors okay now what is this thing called deep learning remember deep learning is an advanced kind of machine learning <laughs> okay so deep learning is not a different thing it's not something that out of the world deep learning is is, is an advanced specialized kind of machine learning right the ideas are very similar here also you have input output combinations you are using some algorithms you are learning uh, some models but the only difference is the algorithms are more complex and in the process the models are more complex okay so in uh, so what kind of algorithms do we use in deep learning we use specialized neural network algorithms in deep learning algorithms okay that's part of deep learning so that's the only difference otherwise many things in machine learning and deep learning they basically overlap okay often times people ask me like uh, should i study start with deep learning it's it's very demanding but you know what i say i say learn machine learning first there's no point in jumping into deep learning just because everybody is talking about dl it's almost like mutual funds no when share markets are rising everybody invest but end you end up losing a lot of money because that's the you're following the herd no everybody is learning deep learning because it's popular but the point is you know learning that makes no sense because the basics are in machine learning so if you know machine learning well deep learning becomes very easy to pick up down the line because all the concepts are very similar in deep learning the only difference is that you're learning a different algorithm you're you're learning neural networks that's the only difference otherwise large parts of the conceptual aspects of uh, the two things are very similar okay here also you're training the machine with lots of input output combinations here also you're using a different kind of algorithm and you're building a model the only difference is 
if you're using a machine learning algorithm <clears throat> if you're using a machine learning algorithm you'll build a machine learning model if you're using a deep learning algorithm you'll build a deep learning model that's the only difference as part of machine learning algorithms we have got several different algorithms classical ml algorithms like linear logistic support vector machines random forest station trees okay and the several uh, uh, these are technical terms but for of deep learning we've got you know uh, neural networks primarily okay cnn rnn convolution neural networks, all that stuff okay otherwise they're broadly uh, say the same thing okay <clears throat> All right. Dan, uh, sorry to interrupt. I think uh, we have to make it fast because it's already fine. Sorry? Hello. Uh, Shine, we have to make it a little fast. It's already fine. We are running out of time. Oh, okay. Sure, sure, sure. Yes. Right. Okay. Yeah. You can carry on. Yeah. <clears throat> uh, Shine, right. you can carry on. You can wind up. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, sure, sure, sure. Yeah. Okay. All right. So, uh, how does this whole thing, how does this whole thing relate to? Uh, just to kind of quickly give you the uh, the broad idea how this whole thing relates to now. So, this is basically how we can how we can think of it. So, we've got the whole artificial intelligence bucket somewhere here. Inside that, we have got machine learning inside that we've got machine learning and inside that we've basically got deep learning okay so this is basically how we can uh, put it we've got ai we've got ml and inside that we've got dl okay so basically deep learning coming inside it okay so uh, and and where is data science where is data science data science will basically come somewhere here okay the, the entire outer rectangle will basically form data science so we started our session with ai and uh, the most part of ai the most common part of ai is rule-based ai Machine learning is a kind of uh, AI, okay? It's a kind of AI, and uh, this is basically deep learning. Deep learning is a specialized form of machine learning, okay? And there are so many examples. There's so many uh, specialized examples we basically have here. We talked about uh, assistance. We talked about uh, Siri, okay? Uh, we talked about Google Duplay. We talked about self-driving cars. Uh, we can talk a little bit about healthcare. Uh, we are seeing a massive uh, adoption of AI in healthcare. Uh, <clears throat> chest X-ray is an example that we have taken here. Uh, so basically. We are, we are basically finding use cases of this in, in coronavirus detection as well. So you can take the X-ray of a person, the chest X-ray of a person, and based on that, you can basically predict whether a person has pneumonia or coronavirus or some kind of lung complications or not. Okay, it can be a it can be a machine learning use case, and it is being increasingly used in uh, in in real time scenarios. Okay, and there are a lot of lot of uh, practical considerations also behind doing these things okay there are a lot of practical considerations as well so for example if i have to give you some statistics this is basically a mammogram okay? mammograms are uh, uh, you know uh, one of the most common kinds of x-rays that are taken in us okay it, it's basically a, a very specialized kind of x-ray around breast okay uh, to detect breast cancer and <clears throat> it is by law two radiologists have to read it you cannot have a single person reading a mammogram okay so very very clearly as you can imagine like if, if you have a human being that is doing this work, it becomes very, very time consuming. Two people have to spend approximately four to five minutes time to read this mammogram. Instead, if I can have a machine learning model do it, if I can have machines look at this X-ray and classify whether this is breast cancer or not, how wonderful will that be? And this is already being done. Uh, in US hospitals, at least uh, it's already being done in a huge, huge way. Uh, you're seeing some adoption in this space, okay? And coming to the uh, world of uh, medicine, <coughs> another very interesting example is the skin vision skin vision is an application that helps you to detect skin cancer so what do they do they you can take uh, any area of the skin you can take a picture and the model tries to guess whether you've got skin cancer or not specifically melanoma melanoma detection problem basically so very interesting again can you write rules for this you cannot okay you cannot write rules because there are so many infinite number of ways those lesions can look and you cannot write rules <clears throat> rather it's like a small kid Machine learning is like a small kid. You train the kid with lots of historical data, okay? So examples like this correspond to cancer. Examples like this don't correspond to cancer. And eventually you train a model based on that, okay? That's pretty much how, uh, you know, so many different use cases we can basically have here. This is something that came up in China around uh, the time the coronavirus outbreak kind of uh, started picking up. So around that time, we basically were using outside subway stations they started using these thermal detection systems okay so what they did was they uh, tried to <coughs> kind of uh, detect whether a person has fever or not 
So they're looking at the image of a person and using that they're trying to detect whether a person has fever or not. So many of these systems are uh, coming up nowadays, especially with economies opening up. So uh, we are finding a lot of use cases of these things now. And uh, just an amazing example of how machine learning can be used in tackling. Again, can you write rules around it? Can you write rules to say, okay, if the facial features or the thermal signatures look like this, 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 the temperature is 36.9, you cannot say that. Okay, it's impossible to write rules. Again, machine learning basically kicks in. You're training the model with lots of historical data, and based on that, it's learning. Given a new person in the picture, it's learning. Okay, given all the knowledge I've got, <clears throat> this, this lady seems to have a temperature of 36.7, okay? And there's one more very interesting example I wanted to quote for all of you. This is basically a company called Landing AI, and this is a social detector demo tool. So what they did was, look at the video, all of you, very interesting. They did something of this sort. Machine learning model was able to automatically do two things. Detect a person on the picture, and two, if two person are coming very, two people are coming very close to each other, it's basically uh, showing a red mark here, right? Basically, it's like an alarm which says that, hey, like you're coming very close. Green basically stands for safe distance, and Red stands for you know unsafe distance, very close. So we're very interesting and landing AI is a company that's actually on it. Very interesting use cases and and just goes to show how uh, machine learning. Again, can you write rules for this? It's, it's not possible. It's impossible. You, you cannot write rules in this kind of context because you can imagine uh, how difficult it will be to write rules. Okay. So two types of problems you're solving here. One is you're trying to detect what those objects are. You're trying to detect human beings in the in the entire picture. That is one kind of machine learning problem you're solving. And the second machine learning problem you're solving is you're measuring the distance and you're seeing are they very close? Are those two rectangular boxes very close? So both the problems are being solved here. And technically, what you saw here, what you just now saw here is what we call object detection, okay? I, I know un until now we have talked about the larger computer vision piece, right? We talked about computer vision in a very broad perspective, but these are the four specialized types of computer vision problems. So classification, what is classification? Looking at a picture and guessing what that picture is. It, what we discussed in the beginning of our session, looking at an elephant and predicting it's an elephant, right? Localization is putting a rectangular bounding box around it. Object detection, <clears throat> when there are several objects in the picture, you're basically putting rectangular boxes around all those objects. Pretty much the kind of stuff that Facebook does. Facebook photo tagging, when you, when you want to tag a picture, Facebook automatically tries to put bounding boxes around it, right? So they're basically using machine learning for that. You can't write rules. You can't can't write rules saying, okay, I think I see a face here. I think I see a face here. You can't. So Facebook actually uses object detection technology uh, in this context, okay? And just to just to help you uh, see a wonderful demonstration of this this thing, just to help all of you see a a wonderful demonstration of this thing, <clears throat> want to take you. So this is actually uh, I'm gonna I'm gonna play a small video for you. This is basically one image. So two, two things. This is a small simple image. So in this image, this is the G7 summit that basically happened, and you're seeing uh, Donald Trump, Justin Trudeau, and Emmanuel Macron, French president. Okay. And so what I basically did was uh, I, I built a model. I built a model. This is a facial recognition model that I actually built. Okay. So you can please ignore the technical nuances here right now. So using this model, using this spatial recognition uh, object detection model, we are doing two things, right? What are the two things we have done? <coughs> we've been able to form bounding boxes around the faces of the people in the picture, and we've also been able to classify who they actually are. It's a computer vision problem, wherein you're able to see and process things around you. So I, I, I can see there are three objects in the picture, and I, I'm also able to classify what those objects in the picture actually stand for. So this is Donald Trump, this is Justin Trudeau, and this is Emmanuel Macron. So this we have done for pictures. The same thing we can do for videos also. <clears throat> because what is a video? A video is a collection of uh, images, right? 30 frames per second, 50 frames per second, right? So we can do it for videos also. So this is the input video. Input video is basically... Okay. Is bugging out early. So this is the input video. Right from the start. As you can see, there's no bounding boxes and all that. Okay. This is what we are sending to the model for processing and the output video using the same code snippet we are basically able to get something like this okay look at this it's not perfect machine learning is prone to errors remember see we can see donald trump in the picture but the box is not coming so models are prone to errors now you see it's coming right now okay two things is detecting what where that object is and it's trying to classify what that object is the so two problems it's solving right okay so uh, these technologies are being used. We saw similar implementations in the landing AI example, and we also see this 
day-to-day -day life in the Facebook examples as well. Okay, there's so many potential use cases. Remember, machines can make mistakes, machines can be wrong, machines can be incorrect because they are not flawless. And typically, one way to look at it is the more data you provide, the more data you provide, the models improve over time. So with more data, the models improve over time. Okay, so that's one of the ways to basically look at it. So <clears throat> let me come back and show you one more very interesting example in this space. This is again computer vision, okay? Very interesting, there's so many advances we have made and one such advance has, as one such has been in the area of images. So I think we have all heard of these stories where you know, AI paintings and all we have heard of, right? So using AI, we are able to create paintings and all, right? So this is an example of that. So what you're seeing right now is a beautiful example where we have taken the content from the turtle image. We have taken the style from this uh, very famous Japanese painting called the Great River Kanakawa. And using this, we have created the transformed image which looks like this, okay? Taken the content from here, the style from here, and we have transformed the image which looks somewhat like this right now. This is what you call the Great River Kanakawa, okay? So this is the this is the transform. This is this is the same thing that you see in Face App. No, if you have used Face App, uh, you can basically take your picture and you can merge your picture with let's say the picture of a celebrity or something of that sort. So you, the content comes from your picture, the style comes from that of the celebrity, and the transformed image is basically the end result that you basically end up getting. Okay, so a lot of these amazing use cases we see. And finally, uh, <clears throat> I do want to talk a little bit with all of you about this beautiful concept of GANs. Uh, just a small example of that. So what is GANs? So GANs are a pretty revolutionary concept overall. So in the entire field of machine learning and deep learning, this is what Jan Lee Kuhn basically had to say. And, and who the hell is Jan Lee Kuhn is a very popular figure in this community. In fact, he is one of the founding fathers of a very popular algorithm called CNN. And he says GANs have been one of the most interesting ideas in the last 10 years, 10 years in ML. Machine learning commercially has been very popular in 10 years, I would say, right? So, uh, and coming from somebody like Jan Lee Kuhn, it's, it's something to take note of, okay? Generative adversarial networks, it's pretty incredible. You can use GANs to generate anything. So all these examples you have heard of machines creating audio, machines creating paintings, machines creating videos, right? AI generated content. We have even had use cases, cases where machines have created entire theses for PhDs, right? Machines can actually write books. So all these are in the domain of GANs. It's generative in nature, <clears throat> okay? And I wanted to show you one use case as, as a small takeaway for the session. There's one use case I wanted to show you. So <clears throat> this is basically an example where we have trained this GAN network and over a period of time, <clears throat> the machine starts creating these numbers. So you can see initially we can't make out what these numbers are. It's completely generative. It's almost like a kid is learning how to draw, right? So let's say you imagine you are, you are, you are one year old and you're trying to draw. You are not able to draw anything. It, we can hardly make out what these are. But over several iterations, now we are two years old, you start doing better. Three years old, better. Four years old, better. Five years old, better. Now you can make out what those things are. Okay, so with more and more training, with more and more training, the kid is learning better how to draw. <clears throat> so with more and more data points, eventually over several iterations, by the time you're 16 years old, by the time you're 16 years old, I think you're able to draw some beautiful pictures. <clears throat> Remember, this is completely generative. These numbers have not existed before. Obviously, the number four, we know what it is, but the number as it is, the machine has created from pure noise. I have not provided this data. Over several iterations, the machine has learned to create a number four or five, five and nine that you're seeing right now. Okay, and we have, we have, we have had several of these uh, use cases in, 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 in machines creating new pictures, machines creating uh, new faces. You can, you can basically create people you can basically create very different people's faces and it's possible today with this kind of technology. Okay, so this is a very interesting area called GANs, which I wanted to just give you a brief about. And finally, just to, uh, with, with, for some closing thoughts, I wanted to leave you with uh, another very, uh, you know, uh, one final example of this intelligent car. So generally speaking, we, you know, when we think of self-driving cars, you know, we, in automation or automobiles, we tend to think of self-driving cars, that, that's one use case. But I think not many people will probably think of this as a use case, okay? You can you can basically have a car which can take job interviews, okay? So I wanted to play this for you for a, a quick minute or so. Welcome Oliver. Glad to see you put on your blue shirt for the interview. 
Yes, indeed. You're welcome. Are you feeling stressed? Um, just a bit, you know. Please allow me to play some piano music to make you feel more comfortable. Well, I'd be better now, thank you. Glad to hear that. Tell me, why should I hire you? Um, I've been passionate about courses on my boy. Okay, let's do a little test. Can you show me where my electric compressor is? Sure. Perfect. Can you explain how my 360 degree test? I think I'm going to do this. You're welcome. So once again, if you think about it, I think this is a classic case of machine learning. Again, you can't possibly uh, write rules for the system. It's able to look at the person. It's able to see that the person is wearing a blue shirt. Uh, <clears throat> from historical data, it's able to understand that uh, you know maybe the piano music will make him feel more comfortable. And and how amazing it is. I think I think uh, based on the last part of it, you you saw that AR testing. We actually talked about testing. Uh, you know, uh, assessment was conducted, and we we have a lot of organizations that are doing this work looking at a person's you know test scores and trying to use ai to predict whether the person will be a right fit but i think more and more of this is actually uh, happening as we speak okay and finally uh, just finally if i have to you know on, on a closing note this is just one last example we see it all around us recommendation engines right so i've taken an example of shazam.com here you can take ghana.com you can take amazon music you can take amazon prime you can take uh, spotify so they are matching users with music okay they're matching users with songs you talk about netflix they're matching users with movies you talk about practo they're matching users with doctors you talk about amazon they are matching users with e-commerce products flipkart is matching users with e-commerce products ola and uber are matching users with drivers it's all matchmaking and you talk about matrimony sites they're matching users with users right how is it doing it again pure machine learning you can't possibly write rules because remember uh these are very dynamic in nature. Your taste can change overnight. So today you might watch a very set of different movies in, in Netflix, very different set of movies in Netflix. Okay, tomorrow Netflix will show you very different recommendations. You can't possibly write rules for it. You can't say if I watch this, this, this movie, uh, tomorrow recommend this movie. Okay, so this is just one, one more way to look at it. And finally, finally, if you look at this one, one thing that we obviously most of us understand is the fact that if you watch Godfather, Netflix will recommend Godfather to you, right? But one thing that we often don't see is even the poster is recommended by Netflix. So they will even change the poster. So based on your user profile, Netflix will even change the user poster at times. Okay, because they're looking at the click through rates. They see, okay, if I give a poster like this, sign is more likely to click. His profile is like this, 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 this. So if I give him this poster, maybe he is more likely to click on the Godfather movie. So you can see for two different users, the movie is the same. For Netflix user two, it's more of a wedding photo. So maybe the user is more romantic and he's more likely to click on that poster. Okay, so that's pretty much uh, an example I wanted to show all of you in this, in this space. All right, so uh, I know we're out of time. Uh, it's, it's been wonderful interacting with all of you. And uh, I think I missed my introduction in the uh, first part of the session. It's a very short session, obviously. The idea was to give you an introduction to the different jargons. Hope all of you enjoyed it. Uh, this is Shine here once again, and uh, I, 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 I wish you goodbye. And, and finally, I wanted to also uh, show you the, you know, present you the final slide from Sync People, wherein uh, you can explore our courses. We have the, uh, the Getting Started course is basically a, a very basic initial course that we, that we have on machine learning. So we have uh, self-paced courses. We also have virtual instructor. Sorry. Yes, Shan. So uh, thank you so much, Shan. I think uh, I would like to brief about it. And before you know, yeah, we yeah. take it further. So once I'm done with this slide, probably I will hand over again to you with the Q&A session, right? So I think, guys, that oh. was certainly a very beneficial session for all of us. And if you guys are interested in learning more about AI, ML, or other technologies. Do check out our batches of VILT uh, trainings on our website, stringpeople.com. And these VILT trainings are leveraged online from the comforts of your home and flexible as per your schedule and location. And if we do not find any suitable batches, we would be happy to discuss and uh, schedule private batches for you as well. And if you don't have time to join live online, then definitely do try out our affordable self-paced courses. The corresponding training website links can be found in the chat box. 
For more information, write to us at training at the red spring people.com or call on our number displayed on the current slide. Now, uh, we all opened the forum for science to answer question and answers and that we have received during the session. So once again, Stan, I'll you know, uh, put it across to you uh, to answer the Q&A session. Yeah, yeah, sure, sure, thank you. So, yes, so so any, so any I'll, I'll quickly take up uh, questions, guys. I think I've got access to the chat panel now. So a, a, any questions anybody has, you can you can please ping me on the on the chat panel or yes, the sir, Q and A panel. Question yes. boxes, uh, just you can see in question box, you can see the questions. Yes, yes, I'm aware of that, uh, Shish. Yes, thank you. So yes, yeah, so all of you can just quickly ask me the questions that you have, and I'll try to answer as many as I can. Uh, <clears throat> so we've had a question that came in from. Uh, um, okay, so. So Vedika had a question, how to begin learning. Okay, so let me take it up from the end. So this was a question coming in from uh, Ishwar. Ishwar had a question, how RPA is coming in AI, right? So how RPA comes in AI? Well, I would say uh, in a way, it, it's a kind of rule-based AI system. So, uh, you know, RPA stands for Robotic Process Automation, so wherein you're writing specific rules, you're writing specific scripts, you're hard coding specific instructions, and you're telling the machine uh, to, to perform certain tasks. So in a way, it's a kind of a rule-based AI system. Well, many of these RPA uh, <clears throat> companies like Blue Prism, UiPath, they also have machine learning capabilities, but a lot of it, large parts of it will be in the rule-based AI space, okay? Yes. So what are the programming languages involved in AI ML? Uh, Prasanna has a question on that. Uh, Prasanna, the answer to your question is going to be, uh, primarily it's going to be Python. Python is a very popular language that is used in this stack today. Uh, but obviously, like if you go back a few, years at least when i started learning this domain uh, python was not as stable around that time although python is a very uh, popular general purpose language but uh, primarily on the ai stack <clears throat> i would say uh, it, it was it was r was very popular in data mining statistics but today i think it's, it's all python although we are seeing a lot of <clears throat> uh, other languages like you know like 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 go and if i could talk about julia julia is another language that's picking up a big way but yeah, so Python still it, it, it's absolutely the de facto leader today. Yes. So uh, do you need any math skills uh, to get into machine learning? Well, intuition level math is important, but not as much as it's hyped to be. So I think there's a lot of hype in machine learning. Uh, you know, some people, it's almost like saying some people read some stuff and they go to the net and they just try to write a blog. Uh, you'll see lots of these YouTube videos nowadays that are doing rounds. People talk about maths and stats and all that nonsense. But remember, it's so, it, there are a lot of people across experiences in this audience right now. Many of your project managers, your project leaders, your delivery leaders. I'm not expecting you guys to like sit and solve differential equations. No, you're not going to be doing that work, okay? So understand maths is not an essential skill. You need to understand the intuition, but it's not an essential skill. So it's very important to understand that. It's very, very important to get the intuition right. You need to know, uh, <clears throat> you know, what is, you need to know broadly what is machine learning, get an idea of it, get a very broad understanding of it. But I would say maths is something that at an intuition level, it's, it's definitely very, very important, yes. So uh, is it right to start AI ML after spending 15 years in full stack development? I would say, you know, take back your experience or take back your experience and uh, look at look at how you've worked with data over the years. I'm very sure uh, <clears throat> that everybody in this audience, although you're not directly involved in AI ML, uh, I think many questions I've had on similar lines, like how do I get into AI ML? The thing is that you're already in data science. Whether you believe it or not, you're already in, you're working with some kind of data or you have worked with some kind of data historically in your career. So I would say, <clears throat> go back to your past experience, see what kind of data you've worked on. Domain is a very important aspect of it. If you're in finance, uh, try to master that domain. If you're in manufacturing, try to master that domain and see how you can <clears throat> you know, leverage your experience in that domain and start applying machine learning AI. So I think the, the thing is not about, is it right to start? Uh, the question is, is more like, how do I start? Because you have to start it because eventually across organizations, uh, <clears throat> you know, it's it, 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 it's an essential skill nowadays. So all of you are already in it. All of you are already in it. Now it's basically about going back and looking at what kind of work you're doing, uh, what kind of data you've worked on, what your, what your expertise is in, and based on that, you need to take it forward. Okay, so, uh, well, I will not uh, make those predictions. AI is not going to replace human beings, right? So at least not in the near future. At least with the technology we have today, people, uh, you know, even in healthcare, I talked about these examples like surgical arms, but I think we are a long way away from, from, that, from that time when uh, probably, you know, 
the, 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 the machines will automatically operate on human beings automatically. So they're, they're still being controlled. So they're still rule based in, in nature, but I think they're a long way away from machines controlling uh, human beings. So definitely not. So so rule. So I would say I would say AI is more of an enabler today. It's not like going to not going to take over for human beings, but it's more of an enabler. Even if you look at self-driving cars like the Tesla variants, they are not completely self-driving. The Tesla variants that are on the roads nowadays, there has to be some amount of human intervention. So, for example, if you don't touch the steering wheel for like a, a period of a minute or two minutes, you know, the car will actually sway. Go to YouTube, look at some of these videos of self-driving cars. It's not completely automated. So that's the most advanced form of AI that we have today, but it's not completely automated. There's still some human intervention needed. Okay. Yes. <clears throat> I would say the future is very bright, Arko. Uh, I think Arko, the uh, future of AI ML in healthcare is very bright, especially with coronavirus. Uh, some use cases we did talk about. Very short session, I know, but you know, uh, healthcare is a massive space. I just had to start talking about it. You know, it will be another two hours or so. But a few use cases we saw. It's a massive space. Uh, you know, G Healthcare even last year they uh, they basically rolled out this uh, this AI detection system for detecting pneumothorax. They even won a FDA approval for that. Uh, Google AI Healthcare. Uh, Google AI actually had released these uh, these X-ray detection systems, lung cancer detection systems. So this is making a lot of inroads in healthcare as we speak today. Okay, companies like Practo are taking a lot of advantages on this. Uh, I think I think a digital ecosystem in healthcare is uh, already getting formed with coronavirus. Uh, things are getting digital. Uh, we are consulting with doctors online. Data is getting digital. So I think it's just a matter of time before AI completely takes over healthcare. But it's happening in a big way today, especially more. I think I think the, the pandemic has been more of a probably a blessing in disguise in a way. Uh, yeah. <clears throat> How do we get problems to get started? Start practice, Srikant. I think uh, I have to uh, ask you to go back to your domain once again. Go back to your domain. Look at the kind of uh, problems you are doing, and especially people who are in a uh, in a leadership position, people who are in a management project manager kind of position look at a kind of problem statement and see whether it classifies as a machine learning problem or not i think there's a too much of hype in in ml today uh, so if you're looking at let's say some kind of a uh, you know how do we put it some kind of a let's say a, a, a task scheduler every 12 o'clock midnight this job has to run so if you're talking about some kind of a task scheduler every 12 o'clock midnight this 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 particular task has to run a job has to run do you need machine learning to do you need machine learning to you know do that do you need machine learning to uh, simulate that thing you don't need it you don't need the model to somehow learn from historical data 12 o'clock yes it ran 12 o'clock it ran 12 o'clock it ran and then all of a sudden it did not run <clears throat> so you don't need that but it's a simple rule it's like 12 o'clock it will run if it's a simple task scheduler, you don't need machine learning models to predict, okay, today is 12 o'clock at night, should I should the model, should the job run or not? No. So I think looking at the business problem and, uh, and identifying whether it's a machine learning use case or not is, is also a, the need of the hour, okay, in a way. And our degrees required in data science, uh, you know, I'm, I'm not a very big proponent of degrees. I think coronavirus once again probably has been a, a blessing in disguise in many ways where the concept of education has changed completely. Uh, nobody cares about degrees anymore, right? If you're good, you're good, period. So it, it just, uh, there's a whole lot of things to learn from. Uh, I think, uh, you know, it, it, going back to I am Bangalore and I am Ahmedabad, you know, getting all those MBA degrees, two year offline programs, you know, universities like Harvard are sending Indians back home. Now you talk to me about degrees here. So I, I don't think it matters. Go to edX, take up a free Harvard course there. And if you've got the knowledge, then it doesn't matter. Uh, nobody cares about degrees, generally speaking. So build a good profile. Uh, oftentimes the work we do is not in our control, uh, but definitely we can take uh, strides to ensure that we are we are learning the things. I think the knowledge is the most important uh, you know, thing in today's world, yes. <clears throat> yeah, in a way, Raj, I think the, to answer your question, in a way, yes, every programmer is involved in some kind of rule-based AI. You're writing code, that means you're, yes, in a way, yes, yes. Well, uh, you know, uh, Sudhir, uh, sorry, I, I think, uh, well, <laughs> well, it's not about, well, it's more about complementing your skills. Well, you're an application developer, that's a great thing, uh, but, you know, I, I, I would say probably you can think of incorporating machine learning. Uh, I think a simple use case could be optimizing the railway schedules, okay, so you can have a machine learning model do it, okay, so, uh, or, or maybe you can think of a, a fair prediction system. Indian railways, uh, how price prediction is done, how fair prediction is done, 
you can think of building a model for that of uh, you know things like that you know things like things like things like a recommendation engine you can think of things it, it, even something as simple as a chatbot okay so things like that could be incorporated in a big way okay uh, take examples from uh, other industries uh, where you know uh, these kind of applications have been used and incorporated that in real ways so that's one of the way it's not about not about giving up your existing skills but it's about complementing uh, your existing skills with machine learning remember machine learning you can do in any language so if you're already a java developer .NET developer c sharp developer c developer we're not asking you to completely move away from that stack so please be there but please pick up the alternate skill okay yes so can non-coders learn machine learning deep learning absolutely yes anita it's a very business oriented skill right so first things first is a very business oriented skill so your technical terms come much later. The maths and stats part comes. Obviously, obviously it comes, but I, I would say uh, first thing, first thing, first things first. It's a, it's a very, uh, you know, it, it's a very business oriented skill. Just like any other, <clears throat> you need to have the business understanding right before you get into it. With all the knowledge of machine learning and deep learning, uh, I cannot possibly build a model to predict baseball players because I myself don't understand baseball. Right, so you need to know the rules of the game to actually build a solution. So if you don't know baseball, then you cannot possibly design a solution for that. Okay, yes. <clears throat> so natural language processing is something very different, Pratik. So natural language processing is anything that deals with understanding natural language, right? So natural language is English, Hindi, Bengali, right? These are all different languages that we have, right? So processing that natural language in NLP, right? Which is what we saw the example of Sundar Pichai doing in the haircut assignment uh, video that we saw, right? So machine learning is a way of implementing NLP. <clears throat> so how do you implement NLP? Using machine learning. So uh, natural language processing by itself is only processing your natural, that, that's the wider domain. So NLP is the wider domain, right? ML can be used in NLP, right? So let me give you one simple example, Pratik, to clarify this. Let's talk about sentiment analysis, okay? Now you read data from Twitter. You read tweets from Twitter, okay? That is textual data. Natural language processing is about taking that, uh, you know, uh, that particular tweet in English and processing it. There can be several things involved in text processing. So NLP is just about processing that textual data. Machine learning algorithms can be used to read that tweet and classify whether it's positive sentiment or negative sentiment. So that is how both the things can be used interchangeably. Okay, so I will not get into technical questions. Well, uh, you know, deep fake is something very different. I don't think anybody will understand that. But uh, yes, uh, to, I think in short, these models take a lot of time to run. Absolutely, yes. Uh, 50 hours, I would say, is very less you got. So uh, I think you're lucky if you use 50 hours, yes. Okay. Um, <clears throat> is Apple Siri an example of machine learning? Well, in a way, I would say yes. Uh, it's NLP. Yeah. The broad, the, the broad uh, sphere is basically natural language processing, yes. Right. Uh, the next level of training is basically we have a machine learning training as well. I think there's a three three days training that we do, and and generally speaking, uh, in you know we look at a machine learning training for three days where we get into the algorithms in detail and the concepts in much more detail. Yes, that's one of the ways we do it. Yes. Thank you, Shayan, for you know taking up the okay. questions, and I thank you everyone. You know uh, we appreciate you being here. We shall be sending out the webinar recording to all the participants uh, soon. I request you kindly to provide feedback before signing off, which will help us improve the quality for our future events. Thanks again for joining us today. Signing off on behalf of Team Spring People. Hope to see you again in our next upcoming expert webinar. For now, uh, stay safe, stay alert, and stay healthy. Bye bye.